welcome from Kirkwood Corporate Training to the Training Tips, Tools, and Lessons Learned for Virtual Training by Selena Pierman. So whether you're a novice or you're experienced, you're going to gain some valuable tools for your toolbox today. So please engage in the, uh, the chat box that we have here. Selena's going to be keeping an eye on that. Um, and I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away, Selena. Hey, thanks, Barb. So welcome. We are already seeing some things in practice, and we're learning each and every session as well. So as you gathered here today, some of the things we're learning about virtual training is engaging early. So as you arrived, right, something to do in the chat box, some expectation of where we'll, uh, when we'll start, what to think about, even roles and responsibilities. You'll see in the notes here in just a minute, uh, Barb is my producer. So we tag team this a lot. Now, we don't always have that option. And so as we think about some of the skills we're honing in this kind of new and different time of training, I want you to think about how you're continuing to move your own to that next level. And we'll do this in a couple of ways. For this time this afternoon, I'm going to actually do some things on purpose. Uh, hopefully most of them will be good, but a few probably oopses. Uh, we're going to change up the setting a little bit, just try some different things, and you are more than welcome to continue to add things into that chat room, questions or comments that you're running into. And we'll look at some of those best practices, lessons learned, and uh, how we continue to kind of navigate all of this together. So no matter what type of training you're doing, whether you're an internal trainer, whether you're an external trainer, whether you're teaching courses, I'll weave in a few things while most of my focus today is on virtual training. Uh, I also continue to teach on the credit side as well, and we're learning some things there uh, about classes and delivery. While that's not our focus today, if there's some questions I can help you with along the way, even outside of this particular webinar, please feel free to reach out. You can always find me through Kirkwood Corporate Training, and Barb can always track me down. If you type in Selena and Waverly, you'll probably find me as well. So welcome, everyone. It is great to have you here. I'm going to take a pause and I'm going to do the screen share piece here. And so I'm going to go ahead and pull up some visuals for today. And there's just some things we know that are happening with visuals. So there are even very specific um, moments I choose about greeting an audience on full screen. Now, there are pros and cons to already having your screen up, whether that's something you want them to focus on when they come in. I have also chosen to have key reflection questions up there if I'm teaching in a series so that when people are coming up, they're already thinking about our material for today. Or I might choose to greet them in full screen and how I position myself in that, how I introduce, how I'm ready. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But today I want you to consider your particular role and any class that you're teaching and training for and trying to create this learning environment, I want us to go back to some of those tried and true basics many of us either learned or learned through the school of hard knocks about what does it take to create effective learning. So I want you to consider for a moment the word effectiveness. What does effectiveness in training mean to you? Does that mean that they're able to perform something different at the end of the training? Is it that you have them working on new skills? What is it and how will you measure it? Because even in this virtual world, we've also got some new challenges of how do we actually know they got it? How do we know that when we have logged in and you can't see them all and you can't test the same way for knowledge that you might do face to face, how can you gauge that? So I want you thinking about that a little bit more. So as we go through this material today, you're thinking about how do I know my training was effective? Is there a measurement we can use? A pre-training survey, same thing can still apply. Is there some pre-training work we can do to have them come in to whatever the virtual training is we're doing? How do they demonstrate that learning while they're here? And then what's our exit piece? What do they have to apply, do, or show differently at the end of the training? Of course, it depends whether it's a one event or it's a serial training where we've got sequence of events. 
whether it is a group that you have on an ongoing basis or whether this is a one-time thing. If it's a group you already know changes the environment as compared to a group that maybe you haven't met yet or have no contact with. So we wanna go back to some of those core elements of really how do we know the training was effective? What are we gonna measure by? And that means for us as trainers, virtually or face-to-face, -face, we've gotta know what we're trying to measure. What is the objective of that training? At the end of today's training, I want you to be able to name additional tools that you can use as part of your virtual training. I want you to be able to demonstrate key lear, uh, teaching techniques that will help engage your learner in a new way. To make sure that we're communicating very clearly what the objectives are for the training we're delivering, how we're going to measure that, and then really knowing our role as trainers and what that looks like. For just a few minutes today, I want to add into that, and if you received the handout as part of the invitation for today, you've got that to refer to. If you didn't get it, please feel free to reach out to Barb Rossin at Kirkwood Corporate Training. And uh, given the fact that we have a new virtual environment, you can always take a picture of the screen, right? That's also now something that we know we can do. I want to share with you uh, some thoughts that I've been giving this over the last few months of what this looks like. So I went back to some of the adult learning material we've known and used and trained the trainer for a number of years. And on the left hand side, this is a lot of what the, the literature continues to tell us in terms of what do adults expect in that face to face environment. And I want you to consider some of the things I've added on the right. How has virtual changed this? So we know that adults in educational and learning settings on face-to-face -face are very practical and results focused. They wanna know how this is gonna impact them. And I would suggest that even in a virtual environment, it's even more so. That adults want to say, I'm logged on for this hour. What is it that I'm going to take away? What is it that I'm going to learn in this class? And so I see some of these things even augmented or emphasized even more. I think it's interesting, though, to contrast that. At, when we looked at the adult learning research in a face-to-face pre-COVID environment, uh, adults are often described as less open-minded. Now, please don't be offended by that, but what the literature on that says is that people, while they're trying to learn something, tend to be less open-minded because they're soaking everything up that the teacher or trainer is sharing with them, and they're comparing it to what they already know, that they're more integrative with their experience and their knowledge, and so it takes them a little longer to soak it up. I think there's an interesting piece going on that in the virtual environment where almost, and you can argue with me, uh, that this has an opposite effect. That to many ways, we've now got some flexibility and, and possibly even some forgiveness or as Barb and I like to talk about, a little bit of grace when, we, when, when we're learning and we're stumbling. But how people may just be a little bit more flexible with that right now, or a little bit more open to seeing this in a different way. One of the characteristics that we've looked at for adult learners for a long time is how they use personal experience as a resource. So any speaker that we listen to, any training that we attend, we're continuously, again, that integrative experience, listening to that trainer and comparing it to what I already know. And yet we also know in that virtual environment, again, I think this continues to be unique and increasing even more so. Because this experience is so individual. And because we've got so many people in varied environments, in different kinds of situations, it's highly unique for them as an individual right now. As adults in a traditional face-to-face, -face, we've been motivated by a range of factors, all those things that we have to continue to do and think about, and the emails are piling up, or the voicemails are coming in, or maybe I'm motivated by something going on in my personal life right now that it's making it harder for me to soak in and, and learn something new. That has definitely been augmented. More differences right now 
range of factors that are affecting people each and every day. In fact, Barb and I were just talking, whether it's uh, power outages uh, in the middle of a session. Yesterday, I was in the middle of a session and my landlord walks in and says, mid-Americans here because we think we smell gas, right? So all different kinds of motivations that just happen in unique ways because we've got more factors involved. Certainly any of that could have come up if I was standing in a classroom somewhere delivering that content, but we've got so many more layers to that right now. We know connected to that motivated by range of factors, just this is done amidst so many other responsibilities and especially now where we've got people at home with different motivations and this morning on a session i heard a cat swear it sounded like a lion right and no matter how hard i try to be very focused and not um, uh, note maybe some of those new sounds that are coming out in training that we've not really heard uh yeah that cat sounded huge Right? And we also know that in traditional face-to-face -face training experiences, adults come in with high expectations. They want to know that their time has been used in constructive and, and, and uh, valuable ways. And I think that's a little interesting in virtual right now of that it, it, it's maybe a little varied. I want high expectations, but I'm ready for anything to happen on this call, right? Of how we now approach learning as maybe a little bit more flexible and adaptable. So I want you to just consider for a few moments, what are you experiencing? What are some of the things that you're seeing coming from students, uh, people that you're training? What are you seeing as the differences in that virtual environment? And I'm going to encourage you to drop those into chat. You can send those to us directly, or you can include your message to call to all panelists so that people can see it. Uh, so feel free to drop that in there. Barb, I'm going to ask if there's anything else you're seeing in chat right now, because, because uh, uh, since we uh, m manage some of the technology and the flexibility, I lost my chat screen. So uh, there we go. Absolutely. No, we are good in the chat. Selena, okay. you are caught up. All right. There we go. Thank you for checking. So here's what I really think is that we have taken everything we knew from face to face. And if you're not a poker player, uh, here's the phrase. We've upped the ante. We've really now started to see a shift. And what we're now starting to prepare for is this will be it for the long haul, whatever this next look is that we will continue to have face to face and more virtual and move forward with both of them. And so one of the ways that I'm thinking about that is it's taken every lesson I have learned for my last 27 years of training and uh, even pushed me to go, huh, what does this look like? How do we actually get to effectiveness? How do we bring adults into this environment with all this other stuff going on and expect something to stick? So we're going to take a look at preparation, delivery, and follow-up for the rest of our time together. And you have the notes in the handout. I'm going to put some key things up here on the screen. And I want you to consider some of the tools and techniques that you're using. And you are welcome to drop those anytime in the chat. All right. And Selena, we do have a couple comments in the chat. Perfect timing. All right. So the first one, uh, first person is looking for ways uh, to get participants to participate and how to engage them and not lose them. Perfect. I'm assuming that's something that you'll be covering later on. Next then, screen. Here we go. Go. Perfect. That's okay. I made that note. What, what else do you see there? Excellent. So also, Helena says something she sees different with virtual training is participants who are uncomfortable with the virtual environment. So needing to get them comfortable with that from the beginning for the training session. Yeah. So let's think about what that means. And you'll see this coming up on a slide, but as people come in, right, it's that touch base. It's the greet by name. Now, it also depends what platform you're using. So today we're using a webinar platform. So my visibility as a trainer is more limited than if we were in a regular Zoom meeting room. So there are pros and cons going both ways. This setup is easier to handle larger crowds. Zoom training where I can see all of your faces if your video 
uh, is on, or at least I can see your name, there's a different kind of engagement there. So we'll continue to think about how do we practice the technology because here's what, and a colleague of mine uh, that actually has a number of books out on virtual learning and virtual meetings says it's kind of like walking and chewing gum at the same time. You gotta learn how to train while you're managing the technology, while you're trying to help other people learn how to use the technology and you're still trying to deliver content. So we'll look at that a little bit more. Let's think about this getting people to participate. And so I really look at it is designing with the end in mind. We know that for effective training, needs assessment still matters. So who is your audience? What is their level of comfort? What knowledge base do they have about your content already? Being able to use some of those good needs assessment techniques, and that's a little bit more pause up front so that you're doing better prep. I have found in the last couple of months with this, with this surge of virtual training, I'm giving more pre-work. So I am ahead of time, including some reading, a short video clip, or some reflection questions. So that they are doing some pre-work and then come to the training with some material already in mind. Of course, it depends on what type of class you're teaching, what that kind of interaction, if this is an ongoing group, all of those key things. But even for my one-timers, where I only will see them once, I've given them something before, I've delivered, and then I give them something after so that we can maximize the use of that time. You know what? When I go back to face-to-face -to -face training, I'm doing even more of that. So that's been a great lesson learned for me just from the virtual training. I have always been a trainer that has said, uh, -uh I would rather see a group twice for a shorter period of time than see a group once for a longer period of time because we know adults do better when there are sequences of engagement. We know just some things on delivery. So getting equipped, headset, background tools. We've had lots of different experiments over the last few months of really what works. And so I choose to use a headset and a directional microphone. It helps me keep that volume a little bit more stable. And my office is on a busy city street. So there are lots of noises going on behind me. I've actually now in my office got two training areas set up. We're starting to see some push in some virtual training for trainers as they are able to, to stand because the energy is different. And so we're starting to see some shift in which background. Uh, we have the virtual backgrounds. If you're familiar with some of the amazing images that you can apply to your own background, I as a trainer have chosen not to use those because I find kind of a funky green screen effect that goes on that because as a trainer, if I move around, my background can shift. But there is just something to pause on today in terms of what equipment is it that you need to do to produce uh, the clearest uh, and, and, and best combination of uh, uh, information and how you do that. We know that the technology every single day, I swear every single session, I pick up something different. Uh, so, you know, whether the, the room is open and people enter in or you have to admit them, right? Um, just the technology piece, like I usually can see my chat. I went to pull my chat, now it's back, now see. Uh, but there's just, we see just different technology. My friend uh, who, who has uh, published those books uh, often reminds me that it is about, uh, just like you were to rent a car at Hertz or Avis or wherever you rent a car from, when you go to rent a car, you know you're getting a car and it's got some of the same features. There's a brake pedal, there are windshield wipers, there are lights. You just have to learn where, which ones are in a different place at different makes and models. And that's really what we see with different platforms. Zoom meeting rooms, Zoom webinar, WebEx, right? Uh, go to meeting, all of the different platforms, you have to play around to really understand what are your options. We know that testing the technology is really important and having a plan A, B, and C because it will be when you're getting ready to go on with that, with that group where your headset will fail or your computer will have to run updates, right? We had a speaker this morning, computer decided to run updates as soon as he was ready to go live. 
stuff happens. And I do believe that we have gotten better at offering a little bit of that space and grace. And yet as a trainer, I want you known for great things. I want you to be able to deliver on that content, which means having some of this done in the background so that it is invisible to your audience. One of the things I would add to that as we look at delivering, and so to the question of how do you get people to participate in that design process prior to this virtual surge, we were designing adult learning in 20 minutes, 20-minute um, chunks. And what that means, whether even in my graduate classroom, in my four-credit undergrad or graduate classrooms, I may have a four-hour night class, but I've chunked the entire evening out in 20-minute increments. Does that mean I'm switching topics every 20 minutes? No, but it means that I'm working through themes because adults, and, and, and there's some great literature out there on that. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to send it to you that says adults do better in 20 minute chunks. So often as a trainer, if I translate that, it's a key idea, it's some sort of activity or discussion, and it's a debrief. Now, that doesn't happen as quick in every 20 minutes, but I design it in those chunks. There is some interesting um, literature coming out. I'm gonna go to this first and then I'll, I'll pick up those other comments that we're starting to see, um, oh, see, technology, uh, starting to see come out in terms of best virtual training practices now, now that we've been doing so much more of it. And there were some recommendations put out that I thought were really interesting. And so I added my own twist to this for what I'm seeing, and I, 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 I find this to be holding really solid. That if you have a complete synchronous session with a group four hours max, um, that three hours and 15 minutes, three and a half hours, three hours and 45 minutes, you're starting to see some Zoom fatigue is real. Let me just say it, right? Zoom fatigue is real. Uh, not just to Zoom, but webinar, virtual, takes a different amount of focus. What the recommendations have been is if you sequence topics in that four hours, three hours, two hours, understand what your sequence is every 45 to 60 minutes. If you do individual or group activities where you put them in small breakout rooms, now we're using a webinar format today. And so if you were in a Zoom or a GoToMeeting or WebEx where you have breakout rooms and you give a group an assignment, what we're seeing in the virtual world is 30 minutes max. If I had you in a classroom and I had you developing a project and you were putting a project plan together because we were teaching maybe project management skills for new leaders, I could check in with you. I could see the pace of the group. And while I can check in on different groups virtually, we just find when it goes to 45 minutes or 60 minutes, it's too much time on uh, without additional direction. So again, think about those chunks. We are also seeing breaks for five to 10 minutes about every hour. People need, uh, and so often at times if I've got three hours back to back, first break is five minutes, second break is 10 minutes. Uh, and then we're wrapping up after three hours. Uh, I varied that. So even as we tie that to engagement, I want you to think about how you really then plan for that. So this is in the prep phase. We'll get to some more engagement in just a minute, but being realistic in what you can cover. Because what I'm seeing with trainers that I've been able to observe and learn from and work with is that if you try to cover too much, you miss engaging with your audience. So the rule that I've been using is not talking longer than 15 minutes without engaging your audience some way. It varies a little bit in a webinar format. However, right, this is again where you can pull in your chat. I can ask you a specific question. You can post in there. We know that it's, it's finding ways to get people, so whether it's on their handout, whether it's posting in chat, if we were in a Zoom or go to or WebEx meeting room, I could use, have you use some of the icons. We have some of the polling features. I'm gonna have you do something about every 15 to 20 minutes because that virtual time distortion is real where 15 minutes feels much longer. We know that there are pros and cons of recording and this directly impacts engagement you have to know your group the best. 
Uh, some groups won't talk if the record button is on. I have noticed that in my own work in business training for these last few months, I have, I have um, chosen that I'll deliver the content and often people will say, can you record it? And I'll say, I can, but we'll change the way people interact. So I've made the decision from an independent contractor standpoint, if I put it in that framework, that I will deliver the training, but that I will do a summary video so that if this is important to the client or for the, whatever we're working on, that I will record them a standalone video with no audience in there hitting key points of the session so that somebody who missed it can get caught up or somebody who is in there, it refreshes their learning. And by the way, another engagement, another way to help reinforce effectiveness. So I'm doing a whole lot more recording these days, but most of the recording is without an audience. And again, pros and cons to it depends on, as Barb said at the beginning, right, we're recording, there's that disclaimer, and people need to know that, but then people choose how they engage. We also need to know the, just the roles and options for participants. So what can people do if they're an attendee, a panelist, a co-host, or a host? What are their options? And that's going to depend by platform. And I mentioned earlier the producer and the facilitator. So sometimes I'm alone. And so I've got to be able to manage that. Or if I have somebody else, what roles can they take on so that I can focus on the content and they can focus on the technology? All behind that for today is thinking about how you're prepping for that class, whether it's an hour long webinar where you're not expecting a lot of engagement, but somehow you want to get them involved whether it's a two hour class or a four hour class, how are you gonna break it up? One of my, I think it was just, it was an amazing experience that came as a result um, of this pandemic as I tried to shift my own training and look for opportunities and how can I help? And I, I was asked and volunteered, uh, it wasn't a paid uh, opportunity, but it was one to be able to support a cause I'm pretty passionate about, and it was uh, an opportunity through NAMI to provide a webinar, and uh, coincidentally in my own world, it was my largest audience ever. It was at about 1,700 people in a webinar format, and it, <laughs> you know, for usually having 15 to 20 to 25 people, that was a new experience, but what I discovered in that experience is while it was content heavy in terms of delivery, uh, their regularly engaging them in chat was a fantastic way to get that participation. So even on an hour log webinar, they had four very specific questions that they had to take care of in chat. And then my producer, the person who was partnering with me, could read those off as well. So think about your own experience, think about your audience and what they're gonna need from you. So just uh, taking a pause there, and practicing uh, what we're talking about, uh, please feel free in the chat to add in additional questions or things that you're running into when it comes to preparing a session. Think about slides, think about handouts, think about how you plan your time. Are you discovering that you can't cover as much content? I know that's been my own experience. I can't get through in a, in a virtual time what I used to be able to get through in face-to-face. So Selena Kelly comments that she really likes to be able to see the participants and have them see each other, uh, really being able to read each other's body language. Do you have any suggestions or ideas for more of a webinar platform when you don't have the ability to see others and read body language? So as a trainer, I think it's one of our toughest things, right? I have to completely <laughs> just bring on what I would be doing for an audience. So truly for me, because I'm so visually oriented, I have some fun stuff in front of me on my desk. Uh, I, won't, I won't put it in front of you today, but, but it just, just some fun, happy things that, that uh, cue me up. Uh, think about how you just have to bring that energy because without those faces, those faces are so important. And so it is, it's just a matter of drawing that up and, and figuring out a way how you're gonna bring that energy. Uh, I do prefer faces, no doubt about it. And, you know, some groups, um, it's a little more awkward these days if you have some on camera and some not. But again, we've got all different kinds of situations going on. 
I much prefer encouraging people to turn on cameras because I feel like they participate differently when camera is on. And yet we also understand for all sorts of reasons, location, bandwidth, sometimes cameras don't work. So as a trainer, we got to keep working at that because that energy has to come even on a webinar format like this where I can't see any of you, right? Any other comments in there, Barb? Yeah, so Paul says he likes to use audio in interaction to keep participants engaged. Um, he said, obviously it is limited depending upon the number of participants and the available time. Yeah. Yep. So we just, it, it varies, right? In an hour long today webinar format when I can't see you and you don't have the audio ability, we're reliant on chat. If I can put you in a meeting room where I can see you, I can call on your name, I can, uh, so one of my favorite activities as we kind of move into the delivery portion of this is, uh, it's one I, I even did this morning. So it's kind of like tossing the ball around the room is that I'll start it with someone and have them pass it over to someone else. And so they'll have to do a report out and they pass it to someone else and it gets them engaged in a different way. So you get the verbal contributions, they're calling out each other's names and they all know the question that they're reporting on. It's become one of my favorite activities. Yeah. So Selena, as you transition into the next part of your presentation, we could have a little fun with this and uh, promote some of the participants to panelists. That way you Ooh, will get to see their face to face. that. All right. So All right. I'm going to so, pick on a few of you. So some of you are getting promotions. You didn't know you were going to get that today. Oh, Amanda, right? I now see Amanda's name. Nice. Now, so just because we're also doing behind the scenes pieces, right? So as a presenter in the webinar format, I have to make some choices of how I set up my screen. So if I choose to have my PowerPoint up there or any slides or visuals, sometimes I use Word documents, sometimes it's an internet source, I have to choose then what my view looks like. So you have to play around with that a little bit. So whether you wanna see all the tiles, right? If you only wanna see a few faces, that's just your opportunity then to really think about how you're engaging. Yeah. All right, and so Selena, those uh, that were just promoted to panelists, if you want to now, you have the ability to unmute and show your uh, video if you would like to engage with Selena. At least wave hi. <laughs> if you've yep. got that ability. There we go. There are some of my favorite people right there. I love it. Right? And that just changes the entire interaction. As a trainer, it just boosts us. Right, because that's, that's part of the energy that just keeps us going. People's faces are so important for that. And if you notice, right, if I go away, so a lot of times I'll take away the screen share so that we can go back here. And I do it really deliberately because if I wanna make a clear point, I'll take off the screen share because I wanna come right back at you here. And I don't want your attention divided to words on a screen. Good. Uh, yeah, so the Brady Bunch view, right? We've all been referring to the Brady Bunch view or um, Hollywood Squares is the other reference I've heard. Of course, you have to be of a, of, of a certain age to remember those references, but that's all good. <laughs> all right, good. So let's try something else. If you're not familiar with it, it is one of my favorite features. I'm gonna put up a whiteboard. So if you've not played with this feature, I have to strongly, strongly recommend it. So if we're together in a training class and I just chose, instead of sharing my screen, I'm gonna share the whiteboard. What I love is I could say to this group, and we're gonna demo it here together. I'm gonna to say to this group, what challenges, yes, my panelists now, thank you. My panelists now have power and my panelists can now write on my whiteboard, right? So be careful who you give power to. All right, so I'm just gonna ask, right? I can open it up to my panelists who can speak to me. Uh, so take off your mute. What challenges you the most? And it's proven that you can't type with other people watching, by the way, just saying that's the whiteboard issue. What challenges you the most with virtual training? And so I can ask a question of my audience and then I can either list it here and collect that so people are seeing something else visually. I can save this so it'll download to my computer so I have it as a reference point or I can send it back out to the group. 
I can use other kinds of annotations. Uh, I try not to draw because it's awkward on the whiteboard, but I find it really, people talk when I put a whiteboard in front of them. And I love that in the sessions. Mm -hmm. Anyone else um, um, have some experience with whiteboard and how you're using it? I've used it quite a bit. I like it. Yeah, oh, thanks, Elena, for that. I've the same thing, Selena. People will talk when you put it up. They do. I find I'm not always the neatest with typing or trying to capture, especially if they want to go back and add something. But uh, but then that's also a fun thing to it the, is to be a instructor about too, and and yeah. that one a lot. Yeah, thank you for that. Because it can be a little quirky. Like if I accidentally take us out of this box, I can't necessarily get back in it. So then I have to start a new section, right? So that seems a little awkward. I think and it's Laura's also using one of our favorite features of raising hands, I saw. Oh. This is so much fun. I, I was gonna say, I also think it's, it, it's fun, right? It's a way for, you know, add some fun to the training, you know, it, because you are typing on top of each other sometimes, or you can add the little um, emoji kind of things, but yeah, it just adds a new way to have that conversation. Yeah, nicely said, good. I wanna make sure, Selena, is my audio on? It is. Okay, I'm at work on my cell phone using my iPod, my earbuds. This is not Speaking. the way I usually Zoom, but you know what? Here it is. That's um, okay. I Thanks, found, man. I wanted to um, circle back to the whiteboard. I love using that too. And then I found that it wasn't touching my typos if I was in a hurry. And so I switched and did a screen share with a Microsoft Word doc. So at least if I was doing like a bulleted list or something, it would yes. automatically allow me to format and that sort of thing where um, as I was making lists with the whiteboard, it, it didn't seem, it wasn't the image that I wanted to give. It didn't look as professional as I wanted it to. Especially since we love your business writing courses, right? So, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so and, and, and thank you, Lauren, for mentioning that because honestly, I have used Word docs as my screen share and recently just discovered I could type right in them. So that, that, was, a, that was a new thing for me to go, oh, there it is. So I really appreciate you bringing that back up. Yeah. So if we think about these kinds of tools, right? Whiteboard, internet chat we've talked about. In the webinar, there's the poll feature. In some of the platforms, there's also a poll feature. Uh, you can use an external tool like Kahoot or Poll Anywhere. Uh, those have different pros and cons. If you're not familiar with them, they're listed in the handout. You can do a little research on them. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, pros and cons. I found I have been using Kahoot with a number of audiences, and I'm going to just say, especially for some of my company training, who just I've got some folks in that training that love gaming. They love hitting the Kahoot poll. I love word clouds that I can do on Kahoot. And so they can type in an answer. It puts up a word cloud, and I can spend a ha 20 minutes to a half hour on two or three word clouds around some discussion and they're participating in that. So not only have they entered it, but they see the visual on the screen and then they um, know that um, we can have some conversation around, it gives us something else to look at. Yeah. Annotations we talked about, so you saw me typing on there. The other, the other part to that, and, and I'll, I'll mention this just from a logistics standpoint, is if I put my screen back up and I put my slides back up, right? In most of the um, in most of the features, depending on which platform you're using with annotation tools. So I can use an annotation tool. And what that means is what I like about slide design is if I really want to spend a little bit of time and talk about internal chat or polling, I'm going to draw your attention to that point on the slide. What we understand is that animations in PowerPoint don't work very well. They don't translate well virtually. So if you put five points up on the slide, I may need to draw your attention to something. I may want to circle something and really have you pay attention to it. I may want to add in a note. I can change the color. I can change the shape. It's a little bit like walking and chewing gum, but it's really practicing with what do I want to draw your attention to and why. And so I really like the annotation tools for that reason. Uh, 
slide design. Yeah. What else? Other tools. Kelly. <laughs> I guess I could use the real rape language. That's okay. <laughs> um, so I like I haven't done a ton of virtual training. I've done a couple, um, but I just what I struggle with. I think it's clunky going back and forth. You know, sharing your screen, doing this, and then I like to show videos. So then you share your screen, then you go to your video, then you have to down at the bottom. You have to like enhance the this and that, and then you have to unhook it click it when you go back and so I just find it really clunky to go back and forth and um, it's clunky and so I it's probably just that I would have I just have to get to do it more and get used to it mm -hmm. yeah. but that's the part of that is the prep that I right like. <laughs> yeah part of that is the prep that behind the scenes so this is what I have found as a tr okay so we're all trainers here we can just talk openly about this right when you know your content you can walk into a classroom and typically pull it off right you're just used to stuff that comes at you if you've done this for a while this takes different effort so prior to all of you logging on right? I had sh made sure stuff was shut down on my screen. I had all my documents prepared. If my PowerPoint didn't work, I have my Word document of the handout up. I also know that I could skip all of that and still talk key points to you without any other visuals up if I had to. So I would just encourage you, Kelly, you know, it does feel clunky. It probably feels more self-conscious to you than it does your participants because your participants have other things going on at the same time. So they're not viewing time as the same way you are. You're like, that was 10 seconds of me queuing that up. And they're like, oh, good. I'm taking a drink of my water because she's queuing something up. I was glad I had Kylie on with me because she's like, oh, Kelly, I don't think you, I, we can't hear the video. I'm like, oh, I forgot to check that box. <laughs> And I think that's where we just have an opportunity, right? That people are just more adjustable in this space, but the more you do it, the better that gets. Yeah. Selena, I have found on the annotation that uh, I love using that tool, but I found if you don't erase it before you change the slide, then you have your little drawings on every future slide until you erase it. <laughs> it, 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 very, very true. I'm glad you brought that up because you're going to see that when I bring my slides back up, right? Uh, and, and I love that. Spencer, did you want to add in a comment? Yeah, to uh, help with Kelly's comment. So uh, as I'm doing trainings, I've got two screens up, which is helpful if you can at all. Uh, and if you're using Zoom, one thing that we've been caught on is uh, or best practice for us is share one screen. Make sure it's the screen and not the actual application. It's really tempting to do just the PowerPoint and then click in and out and back and forth. And what I do is share that second screen. That way I've got my notes over here. And then over here is where uh, my original monitor is where I've got all of the stuff, whether it's videos that are queued up, by the way, on videos, play them ahead of time, get your closed captioning ready so it winds it so you don't have to worry like, oh, okay, internet's going, it just clicks and goes. Yeah. But yeah. then pull it over and uh, pull it back and forth. It's way easier. Or if it sits in your PowerPoint, that can work too. But that stuff, especially if you've got things in uh, PDF or you want to work in a Word doc, it's already there and then you're just pulling it over. So you're not losing those seconds that people are like you know, two or three seconds that someone's going to go get lost on the internet. So nice. that's my two cents. Thank you, Spencer. Awesome. 10 cents. Absolutely. Call from Peter. All right. So as we think about that in terms of delivery, right? Just some other things we can think about. I, on the second page of your handout, listed off some of these, right? Visibly checking your presence, filling the screen, standing versus sitting, selecting your background, looking ready, uploading ahead of time, focus on the attendees as you come in, right? Greeting them by name, engaging them in chat, keeping them engaged often with an icebreaker question. I gave a countdown, we'll start in three minutes. We'll start in two minutes. I, I don't do it every minute. I, I'm way more random than that. Uh, but I at least gave people some expectations. Or if we're still waiting for a couple of people to connect in and we're at go time, I'll say, folks, we're going to give it an extra two minutes. Finish up what you need to. We're going to give everyone a couple extra minutes to connect in so that they know I'm just not wasting their time by starting late. Um, confirming the materials they need to have available to them. So I said in my opening comments, you received a handout from today. You can have it available to you virtually. I had a handout yesterday that I wanted them 
writing on and they were told in the email prep that I want you writing on it. So have it ready, not on your screen, but if, if you're able to and it works for you to print it out. Just even thinking about some of those expectations. So we didn't set expectations about muting and we just know, right, how sound works on these things. Nope, you're on mute. Nope, I just put you on mute because there's background noise and, and they've turned into delightful internet memes and we just know that there's lots of conversation there. Camera off, camera on, right? Timing and agenda. How are we doing on timing and are we um, on track, right? Uh, some of those other best practices we just talked about listed on there, right? Varying the look. So I mentioned going between screens. I don't want to do it every 15 seconds because I'm going to make you dizzy. But if I do it about every 15 to 20 minutes, it gives you something different to look at. Uh, now, one of my favorite techniques is been calling on people, but I will always use your name first. So I'll say, hey, Tracy, so we've been talking about whatever that is, and by me saying her name first and then a wandering question, she now goes, right, I love the smile. She's, she, she perked up, she smiled, and she went, okay, I'm on deck next. Because if I said, so, you know, today we're really thinking about the ways leaders impact culture. And so I want to toss it out to the group and have you give some suggestions. Tracy, go ahead. <laughs> Right? And now Tracy's like, what did she just say? And now I'm processing and shoot, I'm up. Now I got to find my mute button and unmute myself because we all know that takes at least three seconds. And so by saying her name first, I just gave her the cue that, by the way, I'm about to pick on you, right? And she has a little time to go, oh, she's asking me a question. And especially in Selena style, if I ask the question two different ways back to back to give her a little more time, she then can collect her thoughts hit unmute and be ready to, to deliver well, right? Tracy, I won't make you do that today, but thanks for, thanks for being on that. Okay, um, good, so thanks. using a name first is uh, one of my, probably one of my favorites. Um, I also like numbers. So I'll say, okay, folks, we're about to wrap up this session. I'm looking for three key ideas that you want to take back to your team. And so I'll number it off. Okay, one. All right, who's got one for me? Hey, Denise, got one to add to our list, right? And it gives me a way to kind of quantify it, uh, whether it's five takeaways or three takeaways, or again, we can, it, depending on our group and size, I can say, all right, I'm looking for one key takeaway today, and we can toss it around again to everybody in the room if we've got 10 people on and we've got the time, and, and that's how I want to use the time. Uh, we can also do that in small groups. So if I put people in a breakout room, I can say, I want you to come up with three key things you're walking away with today as a group. And I'm going to identify a leader in each of those groups who's going to come back and report out to the rest of the room. Uh, I like the timer for breaks. So I've set up some PowerPoint slides that I can run during a break that have just fun pictures on them, right? Um, you can also, I learned a new trick this morning from another trainer. You can Google timer and Google will run the timer for you if you open it up to an internet screen. So some of you are shaking your head. You knew that one already. I did not know that one until this morning. So just neat techniques that, again, it gives people that visual cue. Oh, I still got two minutes. I can still check my email before the session starts again. Any other before I kind of close up with some last thoughts on how we move forward with this and what we learn from it, any other tips or techniques that you're using that we've not talked about? I think one of the things that I'm struggling a bit with is taking my face-to-face -face sessions because I think people that aren't in this business think that you can just pull your face-to-face -face PowerPoint, plop it up on the screen and do your training session. And I think we all know that, you know, the interactions are different and everything's different. So you have to take what you used to deliver face-to-face -face and make it virtual. So, you know, I don't know, you know, where we used to say, okay, sit with your table and do this. Now I know we can go to breakout rooms and we can get up and now present this and, we, you know, so, and, just, and so I just, just map it out differently, yeah. right? Yeah, I work yeah. my outline and I just know what transitions and what timings I've got and I'm just ready for them to adjust. 
Um, my nightmare was that about two weeks into our kind of COVID reality in March, I had groups and breakouts at the end of the session, including the CEO of the company. And I lost all the breakout rooms. I couldn't get them back, right? So we've all had just, you know, uh, it, I think it just reminds us all that we just have to be really humble and go, I am so sorry. I'm but glad to hear, Selena, that that happens. That stuff oh, happens it does, too. right? Yeah. Amanda, what would you like to add in? Um, I don't know how many of you have used Pear Deck before. It's based out of Iowa City. You basically take New. your PowerPoint and you put it into their system and it makes it interactive with the kids. So I've used it in my classroom before where they can, you can do it face to face or you can make it virtual and then they can log in from home and interact with you. Oh, interesting. Well, thank you for Pear as in P-A-I-R? E-E-A-R, like, like e -A -R, a fruit. as in the fruit. Got yep, it. Deck. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the interesting things that has certainly come out, certainly because this has been such a everybody experience, right? K-12, college, business training, of how many more resources we're learning about out there and how they can cross over into different audiences. Good. Any others? Something I have learned just getting to work with many of you is that when students are called on, that sometimes we're used to uh, more of an instant response. And as Selena alluded to, it takes about three seconds to get unmuted, formulate their, their thoughts. And it's okay to have a little silence during our sessions and to allow those folks um, a little more time than we would in person. Because I think as, as trainers, we, we get excited and we, we look for that response right away. And so I would just caution you all to just give a little more grace, allow, you know, I don't know, five, five, six, seven seconds maybe for people to respond. And uh, typically they, they will respond. And Lauren had a great response in the chat room earlier saying that um, when she calls on someone and their screen is uh, blank, just her name on it, and she's waiting, 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 and they must have stepped away and, and you don't know it as an instructor. Absolutely. Uh, Wayne Termell is the author of the books I mentioned, the friend of mine who's got several out, and he has long talked about the five hippopotamus rule. And he developed that idea because he was teaching in Europe and he used the five Mississippi rule. He was training some trainers and said, you got to kind of, you got to count five Mississippis, right? Which is just a great example of uh, a very culturally based example. And they said, what's a Mississippi? And he goes, oh, that's not going to work. So he, he has always said the five hippopotamus rule. So like what Barb just said, it's the one hippopotamus, two hippopotamus. And as trainers, right, and train the trainer in the face-to-face -face world, we would have talked about to be okay with this space, to have silence, to give people time to process it, form their answer, formulate their response, and to be able to deliver it. Now they get a click mute, unmute. Now they've got to worry about whether they're being heard. It's, it's taken a little longer. It's something really important to remember. Nice. I think if we kind of pull all of this together, what we're seeing is, uh, I, I think I would wonder, uh, and you're welcome to chime in, um, I would love to see some shaking of the head that virtual is gonna be around to stay for the long haul. Right? I think we're gonna continue to see both face-to-face -face come back as it, as it needs to in ways that are safe and healthy for our students and virtual and what that looks like for all of us. I, I think we'll continue to see that shift and I just, I bring it back uh, on your handout as noted, what has been um, uh, published and it's one of my favorite books. So if you're looking for just a great tool using Brain Science to Make Training Stick by Sharon Bowman, she's got a number of them out there. And what I've really come to understand is that it is, you know, she has always encouraged movement over sitting, right? And she's got seven techniques that um, I've listed for you on the left-hand side there. But I really want us to think about how we now translate that into the virtual world and, and create this hybrid experience. Because I think there's more now doing over sitting. Everybody's sitting now in these trainings, but they need to be doing something, right? Engagement over talking. So she has always said, 
get people talking in a classroom because that's how, again, they'll engage in the process. Well, now it's not just about talking because we have all met that person in our training room who can out talk everybody else. Now it's about engagement, how to purposefully give them reasons to talk and manage that because everybody is simultaneous, right? Sharon has talked about images over words for a long time where a picture is much more powerful on a PowerPoint slide or a handout. Well, I would really believe that it's now tools over images where we have to engage different tools that may have an image and images are still important, but long lists of words are not getting us results. Um, handouts are an interesting thing these days as somebody who has really had a hard time giving up handouts uh, over the years, right? That's just, I, I, yeah, I, I am able to do it. Now I've really had to think differently about what is the visual that they need? What would reinforce? Is it a summary sheet? Is it a PowerPoint deck? Uh, I had an allergy to PowerPoint before COVID, just saying this has not helped it, right? Um, of how do we use these tools in new ways? So again, that engagement over writing. I would have you write out some answers. Well, that doesn't look the same in this virtual environment. So thinking about, uh, you know, as Lauren's teaching business writing, right? And, and they're sketching out their sentences and how to write emails better. What does that look like in this kind of environment? We saw pre-COVID a shift to micro learning, more like a YouTube four minutes or less kind of chunking. And I do believe that while Sharon has been proposing shorter over longer for a lot of years, I think we're even a micro versus shorter, that we're really thinking about very acute chunks of content and varied over different. And I really use, what can I deliver here? In 20 to 30 minutes, how can I do it a little bit differently? In 20 to 30 minutes, how do I shift it over here so that I pe keep people going that entire time with different ways to engage? I loved the comments earlier that we have seen people participate differently. They're way more comfortable putting something in chat that they didn't have the option for in face-to-face, -face, right? They just were the ones who were quiet or in class until we pulled them out either as a large group or in a small group. Now they can chat. And so I think it's just got some really neat opportunities for us that way to really look at how we engage. And truly what we're trying to do is get effectiveness. How do we help people learn when stress levels are up, when learning styles are there, but the mechanisms have changed. And I'm just grateful. This perked me up today, seeing all of you. And if any message out there I want to say to all of you is, you know, for all the efforts that this group right here continues to want to make for other people, uh, if we can all also remember in this time, we are not alone, right? We're all learning stuff every day. I am messing up every day. I just keep trying to learn from it. So any way that we can encourage each other and share tips and tricks anytime, please feel free to reach out and let's continue the conversation. Other comments or questions for today? Questions you wanna pose? I know we're coming up on our committed time to you, but I'll stay on as long as you would like. Barb, any other closing? Uh, I'm gonna put up the screen while you do some announcements just because I know we have uh, an upcoming event. Absolutely. So I just wanted to remind everyone again that we will email out the handout next week, as well as a video link from today's session. Uh, we knew that the information we were gonna find was very valuable and wanted to uh, share that out there with you. And of course, we just had to promote, Selena's gonna be one of our featured speakers at uh, Business Partners, I believe kicking off the, the series this year, uh, presented on Squirrel, dealing with distractions and improving our focus on September 17th. So that will be coming out in, uh, you can participate through corporate training and they will also be available through our continuing education catalog. And everything that you heard from today is summarized on that handout for you. So keep an eye out for that. Every comment I've made uh, is summarized on there with a quick checklist for you to be able to continue to work on your own efforts. Super. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you taking the time out to be here and to share. What okay, a and delight. Selena, Tra yes, Tracy's asking, has anyone oh. used Jamboard? She's hearing a lot about that one. I have not used Jamboard. Hmm. I have to look that one up. Thank you. 
Um, I might so be inspired that we might need a trainer, Eastern Iowa trainers group on Facebook or LinkedIn where we can post some of these tools. Anyone else game? Facebook or LinkedIn? Pros and cons. Think about it. Well, I, I know where to find most of you. All right. We'll follow up on that conversation, but oh, it'd be nice to be able to share some of these on an ongoing basis. So no pressure, uh, but feel free to, oh, thank you for the feedback in there. Let's go Facebook. I'll send y'all an invite. Come find me. All right. Thanks everybody.